This week on Wealth Track, financial thought leader and great investor Rob Arnott created Fundamental Indexing plus the first global funds to actively invest in all asset classes. What is this financial innovator cooking up now for better investment returns? Research affiliates Rob Arnott is next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. What were some of the lessons that you learned and that we should take away from that crisis and, and the crisis itself and, and this very fast recovery as far mm -hmm. as the markets are concerned afterwards? The main lessons, I think, are ones that the markets teach us again and again and again. Warren Buffett says we should be greedy when others are terrified, terrified when others are greedy. Um, early 2009 the investment community was terrified. I was terrified, but I knew it was a great time to take risk because people were terrified of risk. A year after that, market recovers heroically. I almost said handsomely. It was better than that. And you have so many investors, professional investors, who think, oh, thank goodness the financial crisis is behind us. You don't think so? No. No. The seeds that delivered that crop, the global financial crisis, there's more of those seeds than ever. They're bigger than ever. So, Rob, what are the bigger seeds that have been planted that you think we're going to have to face at some point? Last fall, we wrote a piece entitled The 3D Hurricane. It talked about deficit debt and demographics. Um, we're spending more than we produce as a nation, which is leading to a buildup of debt to be paid for by whom? A shrinking population of workforce uh, as a percentage of the population. So how bad are each of these problems? Deficit. 10% of GDP last year. There are those who say, don't worry about it. It's a one-off. We have a global financial crisis. We need to spend this money to spend our way out of this mess. I could almost buy that if I believed that it was a one-off. Simple fact is that the 10% was tip of the iceberg. The uh, accounting that got us there would have made Enron execs blush. You have off-balance sheet spending. That's the pre-funding of Social Security and Medicare trust funds and a few other items. They're off-balance sheet, but they're pre-funding future obligations. They are legitimate spending. That takes you to 14% of GDP. You have the GSEs, um, government-sponsored entities, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and several others. Those take us to 17% of GDP. They're now backed by full faith and credit of the U.S. government. So there are obligations. They are our obligations. Uh, a year and a half ago, in the midst of the financial crisis, government said, we'll backstop these organizations. We'll backstop them to a limit of $200 billion. February, they lifted that limit and said, no, backstop to an unlimited extent, infinite extent, all by full faith and credit of the U.S. government. And oh, by the way, one of the provisions of the bill, this will not be counted as part of the national debt. And they're underwriting the entire mortgage market right now, right? Corporate execs would go to jail for that. Mm -hmm. But if you write the laws, you don't. That took us to 17% of GDP as a deficit. Then there's unfunded Social Security and Medicare. We're getting older. There's more people, the debts are growing, that takes us to 18%. The average of the last quarter century officially has been 2.5% of GDP. Unofficially, with correct gap accounting, it's been just under 10% of GDP per annum for a quarter century. So this 10% deficit is not abnormal at all. We have a government and a society addicted to debt financed consumption. That leads to the debt level. The debt level for the national debt officially is approaching 90 percent. That doesn't include state and local and it doesn't include GSEs. 90 percent of, of total GDP. output, right. And, and, mm -hmm. and if you include state and local and GSEs, you're now up to 143 percent. Greece, as the crisis has been blowing up there has been in the 120 percent range. We're above 140. If you add in the unfunded portion of Social Security and Medicare, we're at 420 percent of GDP. 
The uh, corporate debt is 320. Household debt is 100 percent of GDP. Combined private debt is another 420, the largest in the world. So we have aggregate debt and unfunded future obligations eight times our annual income. If you borrowed eight times your annual income, how comfortable would you feel about your ability to service that debt in the years ahead? So what do you do with that information? I mean, how does it change your view, number one, of the U.S. Uh, stock market and bond market and certainly government debt market? And, uh, and, and how do you ad adjust to that as an investor so that that doesn't destroy you? Well, we've been talking about a lot of depressing stuff. The not so depressing part is that there's always something interesting to invest in, always. The aggregate size of our debt, I think, almost guarantees some inflationary bursts that will be daunting sooner and larger than we expect in the years ahead. I think we'll see them um, at least one major inflationary shock in the coming decade, two or three in the next 20 years. And by major, I do mean double digit. Uh, I'm hoping I don't mean hyperinflation, but I don't think it's impossible. The inflationary shocks mean preposition your portfolio for inflation. Now? Do it before inflation becomes obvious because inflation protection, uh, protecting against anything, insuring anything, is cheapest when people don't expect it. Buy auto insurance when you have a clean record. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the notion of buying TIPS, inflation-linked government bonds, they're currently priced at a level that suggests 2.5% lower yield than corresponding long government bonds. Okay, 2.5% means that if inflation averages over 2.5% over the next 20 years, you're better off in TIPS. Okay, so that's your defensive reserve. Sounds like a pretty good bet. It's a, it's a pretty good bet. I mm -hmm. think the likelihood of us managing the next 20 years with 2.5% inflation is somewhere between slim and none. Commodities, when they have their occasional 20 and 30% drops, use them, buy them. I don't think commodities are cheap right now. I think they will be in the next recession, which I don't think is that far off. So I think if there's a second dip to this recession in the coming year or two, and I think there will be, that'll create a buying opportunity. 